we go. I'm Eric Swoldens. I'm with uh, I'm with Nabella. I'm actually the chief architect, but what I really am is just an engineer, which are, we're a fairly small company. So I'm I'm going to go quick here because I'm assuming that most people know what serverless is. But if you don't know what serverless is, I'll just go. It, I'll take just take one minute to say it. So before serverless, what you'd do is you'd write, a, if you wanted to run something which was on the internet, you'd write a server. So you'd write a bunch of code, build it into a server, run this server on the internet, and then it would respond to API calls. And then we have containers, which is like Kubernetes, which is like instead of using VMs, you can do the same thing basically in containers. You run a server process. But in serverless, what you do is you just write source code. You give it to a service provider. And what happens is when the API gets called, the code is basically loaded somewhere, run, and then it goes away. So serverless uh, is you just uh, write the code and run it somewhere. Uh, you don't have to manage a server, and that's why it's serverless. So you don't have this operations thing of operationally have to keeping a, keeping a server up. Um, you just write the source code, give it to somebody else, and they have to run all the servers. Uh, because these things are ephemeral, they live for a short time and kind of go away, you need to deal with user state because unlike a server process, you'd keep track of the state in some global variable or something like that, global variables. Um, in serverless, your code is run and then it completely goes away. It's not using any resources. So normally what you do is you keep the state somewhere. So um, if you're using Amazon, you keep it in DynamoDB. You could keep it in MySQL, it's a little bit slow. Normally you use it, put it in a key value store somewhere. And with serverless also, if you're writing like a React app, you may have graphs and stuff and like a button on the screen. And they'll all be different functions which are uh, executing independently. So uh, that's the way it kind of works. A single page, and this means single page meaning single web page, can be composed of multiple different API calls which are function calls. Did that go one minute? I ah, went two minutes. OK. Uh, it scales automatically because you don't need to deploy new servers. So it's up to the service provider just to scale that. You pay for what you use, which can be a plus and a minus, which I'll go, go into it a little bit. And I'm going to say it's not so good for high transaction per second applications. What I, what, I really mean like, what I really mean like that is bursty applications. This is where you go and you get a whole flood of requests, and then they go away, and you get a whole flood of requests. And I'll explain why that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to give 10 seconds on Postman, because everybody should already know it. Uh, but the good thing about Postman is collaboration, specifically you documenting your API, and I'm just going to skip by that because it's a Postman conference I assume everybody knows. Uh, Postman serverless computing and Postman work great together. So the process flow here is that uh, you design and document your API in Postman. So you design it there. You can mock up your API in Postman so that people can test the calls and the person writing the front end can start developing immediately. And then what you can do is you can start with serverless developing your functions locally. If they're in JavaScript, you can use Node or something like that. Or in the cloud, you deploy your functions to the cloud, and then one by one, you can hook them up to your API. And then on an ongoing basis, you can test and monitor your API using Postman. And so here we'll do an example project. Uh, we're creating an API with Postman. We uh, uh, here we can develop, this shows developing functionally locally, yeah, so we have um, some JavaScript here which we're running nodes so we can test and debug it uh, locally and then when we're done we can push it, push it into the cloud. And if you're doing it locally, of course, if this thing uses a lot of resources which you're expecting on the web, you need to run all those resources locally. So if it's using a SQL database or a relational database key value store, you need to have those running your machine or in the local environment to match the web-based environment. But it is nice to develop locally uh, a lot of the time, because then you don't have to, uh, it's easier to debug. Um, then you can deploy functions, or in, uh, if you're using Nabella's service, you can deploy the whole project to the cloud front end and back end at once. And uh, now I'll get into the, so I hit right on the time. Now we'll get into uh, kind of the meat of the topic of what the topic was about, which is portable, um, writing portable serverless stuff. So I'm going to go into some of the issues that are common when you're a developer and you're developing locally versus the cloud, and also between different cloud frameworks. So this is between Google's, uh, Amazon's, Microsoft's, and Nabella's. And so one of the differences between all the different clouds is that everybody has their own uh, way of dealing with the uh, getting called by the uh, uh, from the API, so the input parameters are different. So if you have a GET request and you have parameters on, the, on there, how you look at those in your code is going to be different. 
the Amazon has actually this context thing they pass you along with event. Event contains some of the parameters. Apache OpenWhisk, which is another serverless thing, has uh, where you just pull that. And so that's going to that's gonna be different. It's not a big difference, though, because the logic of everything stays the same. So this is just parsing of the parameters. And some uh, platforms have compatibility, so they support other ones. Like uh, the Nimbella one actually supports either the Lambda or the OpenWhisk um, signatures for functions. So input parameters are going to be different, but the internal code is going to be the same. The most common code, by the way, used for serverless is probably JavaScript, uh, from my experience, from what I've talked to. Your runtime environment dependencies includes our problem. So here you may have a bunch of packages installed with NPM on your local uh, machine, but then when you're running in the cloud, they have a different set of packages. Also, what version of Node you have may be different between the two, and it's going to be different ones supported between the different clouds. So you want to see what's supported where and make sure that it's all lined up. VPCs is also another thing to consider if you're looking at developing your application in the first place. These are virtual private clouds where you have essentially your own network in the cloud. So Amazon allows you to set these up, a bunch of providers do, where you have your uh, JavaScript code and your database and everything all sitting within a VPC. And so the calls aren't going over the internet. Whereas if you had your JavaScript code executing like on Google's and you had a uh, data and a MySQL database running um, in Am an Amazon RDS, then Google would be calling over to Amazon across the internet, which may be a performance thing, but it's also then other people can get to your database, so you may want to do it uh, in a VPC. But there's other ways to do it, and I'll talk about why you might want to do it another way later on. The thing this creates is a portability issue, because if you have a VPC set up in Amazon, then you really need to kind of keep doing everything in that VPC um, because uh, it's not designed to run on the internet. So just when you're designing things, if you have a VPC in there, realize it can create uh, additional work and problems about portability. This is an interesting slide. So actually, I think this is probably the most interesting slide in the whole thing. This is a chart somebody made. Uh, of the latency between different things. So this is a latency between Google Cloud and Amazon's cloud, actually. And what you see is you see the latency between the different regions. Now, I think uh, the darker color is better, I believe. And actually, it goes down to like one millisecond. You can see that it's going down uh, to one millisecond between Google and Amazon, actually. So you can have cases where in Amazon, the latency is much greater between uh, two servers than between a Google server and an Amazon server. And this is because their peering is very good within the same region. So you can have, uh, for example, your Lambda functions, and if you're calling MySQL, you could potentially have a 90 millisecond latency between your uh, Lambda process and the MySQL server that it's accessing within Amazon. And the reason is because they're in two different regions. However, you could have a, a serverless function running on uh, Google, and it could be calling a MySQL database in Amazon, and you could have a one millisecond latency between them because the peering is so good. And this is where VPCs also, it comes into play a little bit with the VPCs in that uh, if, you, if, you, if you set up a firewall basically uh, in front of your uh, MySQL server and you're calling it from Google, you're getting excellent response and you have something which is cross-cloud, but you also have protection in that other people can't go and, and uh, hit that from outside the internet. So essentially you kind of created a VPC but in a different way. So that's one I thought was one interesting data point is that really look at the regions when you're deploying that everything's in the same region. That's more important actually for performance than if you're using Google and Amazon or something, uh, something else. So here's some, just some general things to know about serverless functions, too. When people hit them for the first time, they're like, how do you do this? So one of, the, one of the initial things is that if you're writing a function and you're calling a database, do I have to recreate a database connection every time? So like uh, the function comes in, it executes, it needs access to the database, maybe a username, password, handshake. That's going to take a while. And then it goes away. Now, the next time it comes in, does it have to do the whole thing again? And the answer is not really. And so the reason it's not really is because what's really going on under the hood for uh, basically all these services 
is that when the first request comes in, it's instantiating the function and setting up an environment for it. And then it runs through the function. And then it keeps that around for a little while, because it's expecting there's another request that comes in. How long it keeps it for is dependent on you know, all sorts of factors, how, many other, how much other traffic is going on at the time. And uh, if you get another request, you may use that same environment. And what this means is that a lot of the time, you'll have the same global variables sitting around from the last time that happened. So it'll go through the global variable initialization. And so you can create a, a database connection through a global variable. And then what will happen is if, that, uh, if a new request comes into the same environment, you'll still have that connection. And so essentially, you get connection pooling for free. And that's what people use it for. This actually is creating a pool within a pool. So this would be if you'd be using multiple threads in this function. But you should know that your globals can get reused from one to the next. Now, if you have a, a connection that comes in and it starts executing, and then another connection comes in, that one can't run in the first one, so you get a second connection. And if they're both making database connections, you'll end up with two parallel database connections. And so maybe, you know, it depends on how many people are concurrently executing functions. But you do get that from serverless. It also trips some people up in that they're like, why is my global variable set up from last time? A second one is cold start. Um, uh, I thought first cut with the, uh, the deepest was, uh, who was it, Cheryl Crow? But it's actually Cat Stevens. I looked it up. Um, so cold start is that the first time you have uh, your, your code executed, there's this thing where it has to start it all up. And then we get, can get the reuse if um, that one's done and another request comes in. But the first one can be a little slow. So this is a time on Amazon, actually. And so what you can see is the first time we executed the function, it took two seconds. Then I waited a second, and I executed the second time, and it executed in less than a second. So you do get that delay from the first one, and that's why when I talked about the transactions per second, if you get a big burst of transactions, those are going to fire up a whole bunch of, of these containers with environments which need to be set up. Now, there are ways to optimize that, and there are technologies which make that a little faster. But in general, you're going to have this cold start thing. It's something that comes with serverless right now. There's also ways, if you keep your endpoint um, hot, basically, by hitting it a lot, that's, another, that's a way to, to uh, remove this um, cold start time. And there's also some serverless things where they try to keep a bunch around. But if they're keeping a bunch around all set up, you know, it's not much different from a server. So part of the thing with serverless is that when it's done, it, it goes away. Another thing to know is that if you, the, that these things have a maximum running time. So if you have a function which is running for a long time and it ends, it's just going to be killed and you're not going to get any notification about it. These times can be pretty long for the actual functions which are running themselves, and they keep changing the time. I think, um, I don't even know what Amazon's is. It was like, uh, 10 minutes at one time, and then they said 20 minutes or something, which is an extremely long function. But there are separate time limits on the API gateways. And so this is where uh, Amazon would like you to have your REST endpoint to go to an API gateway, which then instantiates your function. This actually can get kind of expensive. You get paid, you end up paying a lot of money for the API gateway more than actually the function execution. And you can call the function directly, but then you don't get rate limiting and some other things that you get when you use the API gateway. But there's a separate time limit for those, and I think it says here uh, 50 milliseconds to 29 seconds for all integration time. So those can be significantly less than the function. So if you're looking at running a long-running function like some batch job that does something, you need to look and see the different time limits. And they're going to be different across the different providers and within a provider, depending on the different technologies which you use. Uh, one nice thing about serverless is that you, unlike a server where um, it's not going to automatically log everything. Uh, serverless, it has all this logging and debugging information. Because it's executing the function, it keeps keeping a log of them, too. This is actually UI from Nabella's workbench, which shows uh, debugging of uh, a number of functions and can show recent activity and the different performance things. Because it's, it's, it's executing the code, it knows that you know, this is a function. Here's how long it took to start. Here's the cold start time. Here's all this kind of information. Uh, some platforms have support for versioning, but honestly, it's one thing you just want to look at ahead. This is just a good thing to know about serverless. You want to add something for versioning, just putting a version number in there can help out when you're going from one API to the next version of the API. 
Uh, one interesting th thing, too, is that you can execute after a response. So here, if you have some logging that you want to do in your serverless function, where you, know, you have an API call and then you want to log the fact that the user did this, you can actually invoke another function at the end and return to the client. The other function will continue to, continue to execute. It can do the logging. And so you don't have the client waiting for the logs to be written. And large projects can be broken up into groups of related functions. And uh, it's just a little bit different of a design with serverless um, over writing kind of a monolithic server. Some of it makes it easier to bug. It's certainly easier to prototype stuff and to get things going, because you can just throw out a bunch of uh, functions really quickly. And number eight, which I think is the last one, is out of control functions. So I heard, <laughs> I heard a company once. Uh, from, from one talk, actually, which I went to. I was in the audience, and they said that they got an $800 bill because they just had a recursive call, which they didn't catch, and it just went out of control. And here's where the pay-by-use uh, is good and bad, right? Because uh, if you have something which spins up a lot of other functions and it spins out of control, it's going to actually be wasting money. Uh, many of the platforms, you can limit it at the namespace level. So this is when you have an application. It has a namespace, and you can say, here are the limits. So this, keeps this can help keep this from happening. Amazon actually allows you to do it at the function level. I don't know if anybody would do it at the function level. You just want something overall. And so you want to make sure that if you're doing anything that recurs or that invokes many functions, you can't get into these kind of loops. And that's it. Thank you. This was uh, our platform is Nubella Serverless. It's uh, free if you want to uh, uh, set up as a developer. Um, and it's at nubella.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>